Car collectors enjoy telling the story of how their new acquisition is brought home. Some are simple stories, others involve a trailer or driving many miles. This is the story of how a 110 ton amphibious 1959 Lark LX arrived at Lane Motor Museum. It involves a long water journey and then a drive through downtown in what we believe to be the largest wheeled vehicle ever driven on the streets of Nashville. The Lark is 62 feet long, 26 feet wide, and almost 20 feet high, about the same size as three 18-wheel tractor trailers parked side by side. The four tires stand nine feet tall, and each is powered by its own six-cylinder Detroit diesel engine. Even with a 75-foot turning radius, the Lark is surprisingly agile. Nevertheless, this would not be a simple move. Lighter, amphibious, resupply cargo vessels, or LARCs, were built at several different U.S. shipyards for the United States Army in the 1950s and 60s. They came in sizes ranging from the smallest Lark V, capable of transporting 5 tons, to the largest Lark LX, which is capable of transporting 60 tons from ocean to inland. LX is the Roman numeral for 60. The Lark was built to enter the water from shore, move out into the ocean where a ship had anchored, load its cargo bay, and return to the shore for unloading when a dock was unavailable. On June 7, 2004, the Lark LX began its journey to Lane Motor Museum from a location near Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The water journey began with a tugboat pushing the Lark around the tip of Florida, up the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway to the Cumberland River, and finally coming to rest at the Port of Nashville after 21 days on the water. Had it made this part of the journey under its own power, two four-foot propellers would have moved it through the water at seven knots. The first attempt to remove the Lark from the river failed. Just before it cleared the water, one of the two cranes began to tip. On the second attempt, Elliott Crane Service brought in a massive machine along with three truckloads of support equipment. Carefully, they inched the Lark out of the water and raised it 40 feet. At approximately noon on August 17, 2004, the Lark's wheels touched solid ground. Museum restorer Greg Coston then began the work required to make the Lark roadworthy. He repaired the drive system, the sprag clutches on each gearbox, and the compressed air system which operates the controls for engine speed, transmissions, engine starters, and brakes. Coston spent hours tracing down miles of tubing to find the malfunctioning valve at the end of some problem. December 6, 2004 was deemed the day to test drive the Lark. With museum director Jeff Lane behind the wheel, they spent a couple of hours practicing turns, trying the three transmission speeds, and testing the brakes. After completing a few more repairs and removing the top portion of the driver's cab to reduce the height for moving, the Lark was ready for its land journey. Carlos Lewis and Sons house movers were brought in to orchestrate the move from Cherokee Marine Terminal at the Port of Nashville to Lane Motor Museum. They calculated the size of the Lark measured heights of power lines and road widths, and prepared the route. Lewis was confident he could move the Lark if Lane could drive it and keep it running. January 10th, 2005 was selected as the big day. Our permit would allow us on the road only after 10 p.m. The night was clear with an unusually warm temperature of 55 degrees. Oversized load signs were affixed to the front and rear while flashing red warning lights were posted all around the vehicle to warn other cars of imminent danger. Spotters were posted on the Lark at the front left and front right sides. A crew was on the ground and everyone was connected by walkie-talkie. Lane had an earpiece as his ears would serve in place of his eyes. From the driver's seat, he had no way to actually see what was in his path. We leave Cherokee Marine Terminal on Cowan Street in North Nashville at 10.20 p.m., turned onto Jefferson Street and crossed the Jefferson Street Bridge. Along the way, a spotter points out traffic lights that are just inches above our head. The north side of Bicentennial Mall passes on our left, and we have a great view of the Capitol and the downtown skyline. Lane is concentrating on the instructions he receives through his earpiece. Every move is smooth. When we can, we utilize three lanes of traffic, two hours, one oncoming. On Mclemore Street, we find ourselves very close to the concrete wall that is part of the James Robertson Parkway viaduct. Lane engages the steering wheel to allow him to steer independently. Apparently, air in the hydraulic lines has allowed for a misalignment of one of the wheels. 
our master mechanic Costin determines we are 5 to 10 degrees off. This is the first tight spot, but all things considered, this is probably the best place to slow down, as Macklemore appears to be an unused street this time of night. By 11.30, we get the tires straightened out and again move slowly forward. We closely pass a light pole on the left, and a spotter holds up his thumb and index finger, indicating we had two inches to spare. A police car sits in the downtown YMCA parking lot watching as we turn onto Church Street. At 11.47, Lane lets out a sigh of relief as we head down 8th Avenue with five traffic lanes to maneuver on. We find ourselves stopped in the middle of the intersection of 8th Avenue and Broadway, but begin moving after one minute. How it must look to see the Lark passing between the Federal Courthouse and the Customs Building. At midnight, we drive past the Greyhound bus terminal and across to Munbrian. As we pass some all-night establishments, there are actually people standing on the side of the street to watch our procession. At 12.15, we proceed very slowly under the Interstate 40 underpass. This is going to be close. The girders of the eastbound bridge touch the Lark's safety railing on the right side, and we hear ping, ping, ping as we pass under. The steel girders pass about a foot over the instrument panel. The westbound underpass is much higher, with about a foot clearance. Costin checks the gauges and notices one engine is out. We stop in the middle of Lafayette to restart the engine. People are now yelling up to us, What is it? Where are you going? As we maneuver the Fessler's Lane area, we encounter heavy truck traffic, but feel at home with the big rigs. Elm Hill Pike brings an incline and the strong smell of diesel fuel. Being under the street lamp so closely has really lit up the way. The final road is Arlington Avenue, a small two-lane road, the narrowest we have traveled. As we see the back of the museum, Lane admits he's had his fill of driving the Lark for the time being. At 1.40 a.m., we drive through the back gate. The Lark is on Lane Motor Museum property. We head to the back loading docks where it is necessary to make a 10-point turn to back the Lark up to the building. The Lark LX arrives in her home port at 1.50 a.m. While the top speed of the Lark is 16 miles per hour, we have traveled only six miles in three hours for an average speed of two miles per hour. Calculations will later show we consumed 10 gallons of diesel fuel per mile. Even though we have not taken the Lark back on the road, Lane Motor Museum finds ways to demonstrate it once a year to our guests. To the delight of the crowd, it did a monster burnout during one demonstration. The Lark is now a television celebrity after appearing on ESPN2 in April 2007 on the TV show Gears. The highlight of the segment was when the Lark backed over an unsuspecting museum car. I hope none of you parked in the back parking lot today.